that's delicious. Yum. Yum, yum, yum. challenge has been during this last week and I only have maybe two more days to go <laughs> thank God is uh, my wife has been gone visiting her kids which is good and every year we take the opportunity to for her to go visit her children that are grown and to see her grandkids because we don't have a lot of money or anything and we can't do it during the year and we have other requirements and needs and we don't <laughs> have maybe like a lot of people do the uh, funding you know <laughs> to go do the things that we might want to do different times in our life but <coughs> the joy of that <coughs> as my wife has discovered <coughs> excuse me good coffee is that when you live a life of dependency upon God God makes himself real when you're independent then you have a tendency to not be real it seems to be more of a imagination than a realization and a lot of times I think that's what people do is they like to imagine things rather than realize things because it's easy to make something up than it is to actually know something's true where are you at like that do you tend to have a faith that's more made up than real <laughs> I think you'll find that life is going to come crashing in on you if your faith is made up of imagination rather than realization of him revealing himself to you. And so my wife has discovered, you know, and I've enjoyed her journey in faith in how God does that. You see, she's watched me in action at times where I said, look, I'm not anybody special. I'm no genius. I'm no marvelous mystery man. You know, I'm no great saint. You know, I'm just a man. You know, I'm a man with God. And I said, you know, walking with God is just going to show you that, hey, you know, I depend on Him. He doesn't depend on me. And that as much as I understand about Him, you're going to find that I would prefer you to discover on your own your own faith and walk with God than to be dependent upon me and follow me because anyone could live in my shadow. I mean, way back when, you know, if it were probable or possible, I could have made disciples of Michael, you know, and had them follow me and said, who look at the nest on the chest, you know, and carved one in the hair on my chest. Yeah, I could do that. <laughs> but, you know, being loved by the Son of God, being touched by the Son of Man, having God in you, you don't want for yourself anything. You want to just spend time with God. You <laughs> just enjoy Him. <laughs> the rest of everybody else, they can go do what they want to do. Who cares? <laughs> you guys go party, man. I want to go deal with Jesus. You know, I'm having fun. <laughs> I'm enjoying Him. He's good. I've tasted and seen that God is good. And I love it. <laughs> you know, if somebody would... You know, and I even leave this out. I told my wife the other day, and, you know, God only knows what will happen to me now. But, you know, all my life I said, no, no, no. You know, that I'd never be a pastor, you know. Nah, I don't want to be a pastor, you know. i got to deal with all those people then. <laughs> but I told her the other day, this last year in 2011, I said, you know, honey, I said, you know, God's been working on me over the years, you know, I said, you know, for 30 some odd years, you know, I've said, after working with pastors and working in the ministry and done church secretary and administrative assistant and been a missionary and been an elder and been a deacon and been this and been that and been here and been there and been everywhere, you know, I said, you know, if God really wanted me to be a pastor or somebody, you know, called me up and said, hey, you know, 
we, we watched your video, you know, and we were thinking, you know, how'd you like to come be a pastor? <laughs> I thought, man, you know, as much as I love to talk about Jesus, heck yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd do it for free if I could figure out how to transfer my life. <laughs> and I think I've done it for free before. But, you know, I, I shared with her that fact because she saw me one day when I was at a congregation recently, or maybe it was a couple of years ago. And, uh, oh, it was such a night. It was so cool. God wanted me to talk to this church, and I was against it. <laughs> I mean, flat out. I was busy working in a ministry for this pastor, as usual, hoping to get this church off the ground, you know, and that's normal. <laughs> and uh, I was underneath a, a building, typical, and in the basement, crawling around the dirt, you know, trying to get this heater to work because it was not working, you know, we needed it for the winter. And, you know, one of those things, and I get this phone call, and I'm like, down underground, you know, and dealing with this phone, you know, and dealing with God, and Finally, I said, you know, I really don't want to do this. As a matter of fact, I would prefer rather to go ahead and and not share or not teach. But then what happened was that when I opened my mouth to say it, I said yes. And man, what a shock that was, because I was firmly convinced, I was totally persuaded that there was absolutely no way that I was going to get up in front of a church, because, you know, I'd done that, been there, done that, you know, I was like, that's for other people. <laughs> Anybody who's seen these videos already know, I don't have a problem getting in front of people. Well, long story short, this was kind of a a little bit of a Pentecostal church, you know, they kind of, they're kind of more loose-based than firm-based. <laughs> and so when I went there, they were getting ready to go to, I think, the Philippines. And they were worshiping, and I just enjoyed the worship, you know. And then they introduced me, and then I shared my testimony, basically. And, uh, you know, I was sharing also Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which if anyone knows, don't, don't let me talk about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. God knows we'll never get out of here. Well, I think it was two hours, over two hours, or three hours, maybe. I think it was two hours later. Finally, I said, well, you know, I'll tell you about more, but, you know, <laughs> if I talk about Jesus, I could talk all night. And finally someone said, eh, it's okay. <laughs> and so we went home. But it was a wonderful time. My wife was so amazed at how I had become different because I was mindful of who I was talking about and sharing all the experiences of my life with Jesus and how, not just my salvation experience, but how God had used different points of time in my life to prove out Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and how real that can be in your life and how real God can be. And so demonstrating that and sharing that with the congregation, <laughs> they were talking about it for months. <laughs> I went back and the pastor said, man, he says, everything you said was right on, you know, and he says, it was all things I was talking about that morning, you know, in, in devotionals and prayer and they said, man, I've never seen the congregation so lit up and talking and, you know, rapping and they just kept bringing up things and we kept talking about it and bringing up things we kept talking about. And he said, man, we just kept going and going and going. And I went, no, oh, praise the Lord, you know. <laughs> I was like, who am I? And I took off, you know, didn't pay much attention. And uh, they recorded it. <laughs> Unfortunately, they didn't record the video. But they recorded it on the CD and when I played it, I got a kick out of it, you know, I mean, it was kind of like God talking, and I was going, wow, Lord, that's cool, because it didn't seem like me, you know, I was like, every man of God, if they're really inspired by the Lord, knows full well that they're not the ones doing the talking, it's God doing the talking, the Holy Spirit comes in and changes you and makes you into what you need to be at that moment to minister to the people, because that's what Jesus said, he said, look, don't think about what you're going to say before you say it. 
don't plan out what you're going to do before you do it. Your Father in Heaven will give you what you need to say and what you're going to do. Pastors. You know, I've met a lot of pastors that always tell me, you know, they spent weeks getting ready, or a week getting ready, deliver their message, you know, and I'd listen to it and I'd go, well, yeah, that sounds like a speech. <laughs> you know, and heck, I took speech, you know, I mean, I'm a writer, you know, I mean, I know how to write, you know. So I'd listen to them talk, you know, and they'd give these talking points, you know, that would kind of like go down in an organized manner, you know, and you'd have your reading and then your dissertation, you know, an explanation as it's going through the reading. First you do the overview, and then you do the line-by-line -line view, and then you do the applicable means view of putting it into context, and then you make it applicable to the person, and then you take personal application to yourself, and, you know, there's a whole format to this whole idea of giving a well, what do they call it now? I call it preaching, but it's really, what they like to call it is expositional teaching, you know. It's a new way of saying preaching, <laughs> because that's what it is. It's actually a dissertation. A person gets up, and what they do is they dissertate, or they give you and disseminate information from the scripture. They literally just tell you what the scripture says, you know, and then how it applies to themselves, and how it applies to you, and how it applies to this, that, and the other thing. But it isn't teaching, because teaching isn't just the idea of giving a lecture, but it's meant to be an application of involvement in the learning process. And so, somewhere along the line between Spurgeon and Tozer, we now got the after effect of all these people running around doing these expositional teachings that I think they're preaching. <laughs> so for me, you know, once I listen to them, I kind of go, eh, you know, okay, eh, you know, okay. And I just basically am bored, you know, because I already know what's coming, because I'm, I have a logical mind, you know, I mean, I can tell what they're going to say, what they're going to do, where they're going to go, and how they're going to say it, and what they're going to say about it, and how it's going to be. And, you know, I was kind of bummed out, because, you know, it's kind of like I stopped learning, almost. You know, I mean, I learned on my own, but then I ran into, you know, Francis Chan, and it's kind of like... <laughs> hey, this guy's cool, you know. Well, I'm sure he studies, you know. But he he thinks about it, you know, and he thinks it through. And I think that's what sometimes pastors have forgotten to do. And that's the one thing that I wanted my wife to do when I first told her to not walk in my shadow or to become under my tutelage was because I wanted her to think on her own. I bet you didn't think I was going to get back to my wife. <laughs> See, I know where I'm going. <laughs> no problem. I'm Jewish. I can go all the way out there and come all the way around full circle and back. But the point being is that I wanted her to be able to think, just like I want you to think. As a disciple of Jesus, as a follower, you should have a mind. Where? <laughs> you know, it flew the coop. No, when you got saved, it wasn't like God said, hey, you know what, I'm going to take your mind and throw it out, you know, and I'm going to give you the mind of Christ, you know, and you're not going to think anymore. You're just going to believe. You just got to believe. No, you have intelligent faith. You just take on a practical basis what God says and do it. That's it. It doesn't involve a lot of brains. And frankly, faith is pretty simple if it's childlike, so it doesn't amount, amount to much forethought. What usually gets people in problem gives people a problem is they get too intelligent, they don't know how to go back to the lack of needing to think it through and to plan it out and to make some kind of theological presentation so that they sound important. I get tired of that, don't you? So I wanted my wife to learn on her own to choose her own direction. So I purposely avoided, you know, disciplines or different things to let her get saved, grow in her knowledge of Jesus, decide for herself her lifestyle choices and then what she wanted to do in them. And those have developed into the good graces of studying daily. You know, she reads her Bible every day. Well, she doesn't really study, you know. That's the only thing that I kind of regret, you know. Like, she really hasn't gotten to a place to study. You know, it's kind of, she knows how, sort of, but, you know, but anyways. Typical husband, right? <laughs> so, as I was thinking of this, you know, and telling her that, I was thinking of you and then most people. 
you know, they have some kind of religious background, so they usually fall back into that, you know. And she did. She went into reading her Bible every day, and she reads it over and over and over again because people told her. So she reads it every day faithfully. Then she prays faithfully every day. Cool. Now, for me, I was kind of different. I was like, when I got saved, I was like, all into the Bible studying and, you know, tearing it apart and reading it and finding out this and finding out that and applying this and applying that and putting this down here and putting that over there and going, wow, and then going, Lord, are you there? You are? Oh, cool. Because I always thought he was real. <laughs> oh, well. So I kind of went on Crash Course 101 to get farther along than what I would have done had I been regimented into just kind of progressing in some dogmatic way. So, my reality of knowing was there, but my experience of showing wasn't. Because I was still learning how to deal on the inside, so that when it was time, it came on the outside, <laughs> now you see, and now you don't. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. And being such that I'm full of that kind of joy, I told my wife one day, I said, you know, honey, you've come a long ways, you know. I said, you've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of ministries. You know men and their failings. I mean, obviously, being married to me. I mean, uh, wouldn't it be neat, you know, to just see if God would open up the doors to something unique that would be fun to have, like, you know, the way that I've always been saying that we should have, kind of like, you know, you have a little church, you keep it little, then when it starts to get too big, you send them out to go start a church, and you have to go get it started. Because <laughs> you don't want it getting too big, trust me. Try to keep it small. That could, be a, that could be a lesson to you, you know. You don't want big. You never want big. You want small. Small is good. Few. Many called, few chosen. Get it? You don't want many, many. Because if the weeds grow up more than the... You got it. But the point is, is that God wants you to experience Him, to learn from Him, and to know Him in a way that you never really understood before. So that He would take you beyond what you thought you would never do to what you might do to what you could become. Dare I say, maybe? <laughs> Who knows what God may do to me now that I've come full circle to the place of enjoying my God to the degree that I do. Because you see, that's really what God wanted from the beginning. He didn't want us to walk around bummed out, blown out, frustrated, beat up, depressed all the time. Although I'll admit, you know, I'm kind of stumbling around because it's been a week without my wife and kind of bummed, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I kind of miss her, you know, golly gee, you know, I got to cook my own meals, you know, eat out, you know, wash my own clothes, make my own bed. So what if I got the remote? It's no fun when somebody doesn't want to argue about it. Who cares if you you get to do what you want when you can't argue about doing it because you want someone else to do it with you. Man, that ain't no fun. Heck. The only person to talk to is God. You know what he's like. So yeah, I've been kind of... Uh, you know. Loving it. <laughs> Because it takes me about a day or two, and then I'm back in my alone streak with God, and I'm like, yeah! <laughs> Woohoo! And just enjoying it. Oh, there's been down times and up times and around times, but the reality is, is, you know, there is nothing better that I could say to you than to go with sharing God in some way. Because once you begin to share God, once you begin to talk about Him, and begin to really let others know about who God is. God will take you and just keep changing you and rearranging you and just turning things inside out and you just be, you'll just wind up going, 
<laughs> you love it. <laughs> You'll be like those little kitties that you see leaning back going, <laughs> you know. Of course, that's what I think because I don't have a cat. Or those dogs that just go, when their bellies are being rubbed, you know, kind of. <laughs> well, you get the picture. But you'll just be basking in the glory of the Lord and enjoying it. So get out. Get going. Go do it. You're a disciple. You're meant to give your utmost for his highest because you want him to do the uttermost for you. And every virtue we possess, all my springs are in you. Psalm 87 7. And you know what we're going to read because you got the book. If you don't got the book, go on the internet, Google my utmost for his highest, and you can read a free ebook. They're free, they're all over the place on the web. <laughs> you can even download it on your iPod or your phone or whatever. You can find it on those too, because it is all over the place. There's even apps for it to get a daily dose of utmost. So that's why we chose it for discipleship, because not only is it always available free, but it's going to beat you to death. <laughs> yes, it will. All my springs are in you. Our Lord never patches up our natural virtues. That is, our natural traits, qualities, or characteristics. He completely remakes a person on the inside. Put on the new man, Ephesians 4.24. In other words, See that your natural human life is putting on all that is in keeping with the new life. The life God places within us develops its own new virtues. Not the virtues of the seed of Adam, but of Jesus Christ himself. Once God has begun the process of sanctification in your life, watch and see how God causes your confidence in your own natural virtues and power to wither away. Man, if you think you got any ability at all to prepare, to get ready, to teach, to preach, to be some kind of leader, good luck. <laughs> I mean, I could name, mention Jimmy Baker, you know, or I think it was Jim Baker, Jim Baker, and uh, according to his own words, there's a testimony. He was called to the ministry. He was called to preach. He was called to teach. And whew, like a rock star, went shooting up far. And like those stars in the sky came falling down. And now we know why. So don't think that it's in your ability. Because otherwise, your capability will come crashing down on you. <coughs> the funny thing is, is that when I got saved, I got slapped into a hospital bed and was dying, so I had no ability to start off and look at me now. Ooh, we're going dancing tonight. <laughs> but the reality is I was supposed to die before I was 30 and now look at me now, I'm running around and enjoying life. <coughs> Dare I say it. Uh, I'm 50. What was that? Huh? Huh? Over 50? <laughs> and I still got hair. How's that for Greg Laurie? Where? Where? <laughs> Once God has begun the process of sanctification in your life, watch and see how God causes your confidence in your own natural virtues and power to wither away. He will continue until you learn to draw your life from the reservoir of the resurrection life of Jesus. Thank God if you're going through this drying up experience. You'll find yourself at some point in time at the end of your rope. Not once, not twice. For me, it's every year. As a matter of fact, it's going to sound humorous you know, to you, maybe, listening to this tape, but I'm in my end of my rope time. Yeah. During this week, I have been crushed, stuffed, mounted, planted, destroyed, whacked out, in sin, out of sin, forgiven. Redeemed, filled, flowing, growing, stomped on, beat up, and resurrected. <laughs> Sometimes all in one day. But the reality is, is that 
Yeah, you will come to a place and a time that no matter what you do in your own little world of disciplines, God brings you to the end of your rope because he wants you to be just obsessed with the reality of knowing that when you have him, when you're filled with that time of him, you enjoy it so much more than having gone through the things that you went through. And then later he shows you how to use those things that you endured so that you could become the man of God that he wanted you to become and the woman of God full of steel in your soul. That you're no longer led by any emotion, but you have a complete devotion to him. He will take you all the way to that place where it looks as though death is the only resolve for you. The sign that God is at work in us is that he is destroying our confidence in the natural virtues. Because they are not promises of what we are going to be, but only a wasted reminder of what God created man to be. If you think you're good, remember, the scripture says, in me there dwelleth no good thing. The good that I would I do not, and that which I would not I do. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? Spoken by Paul at the height of his ministry. How could that be? It is the saddest thing to see people who are trying to serve God depending on that which the grace of God never gave them. In other words, sometimes you'll see that people will step out on a limb and claim things that he never said to them. He'll tell them, they'll tell you things he never said or never did. And sadly, they'll be convinced of it for themselves, but it doesn't seem to bear much fruit in anyone else. God does not take our natural virtues and transform them because our natural virtues could never even come close to what Jesus Christ wants. No natural love, no natural patience, no natural purity can ever come up to his demands. But as we bring every part of our natural body life into harmony with the new life God has placed within us, he will exhibit in us the virtues that were characteristics of the Lord Jesus. You want to know what Jesus is like? I mean, people keep telling me, well, Jesus wasn't a doormat. He was rough and tough, man. I mean, he was, he beat them Pharisees to death, you know. He took out his old Holy Spirit, you know, kind of gun, and he shot him with, you know, Word of God stuff, you know, and he just beat him around. No. The Word of God says bluntly that, you know, a smoking flax he would not extinguish, meaning that a little candle flame just barely flickering, he wouldn't put out. None. A wee reed wallowing back and forth in the wind, he wouldn't break it. Man, I mean, he's the most tender of people. What was Jesus like again? Oh, you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, everyone. Drives out, out of the temple. Oh, all those money changers and tax collectors. Let's be real. You got a bunch of cattle, or you well, goats and sheep. You got a bunch of pigeons and birds, turtle does. And you got a bunch of tables. Man, if I turn over one table, let's just say that we're at a, a stall at the country fair. Yeah, by golly. I've been to some of them fairs out in the country. Mm-hmm. Man, we've been to 4-H and FFA. Man, we had all them cattle all together, you know, and we were just getting ready to, you know, slop the hog, you know, and bring out the the sheep, you know, and we were going to, you know, show off all them animals, you know, and all of a sudden, you know what happened? Somebody let off a firecracker. Uh-oh. You know what happened to the sheep? You know where the cattle went? You know where the birds went? They flew the coop. They ran. They were all over the place. I think Jesus was driving the animals, and he wasn't whipping the people. Really? 
Jesus was raised in the country. Come on. I mean, you think you don't know what the animals will do? You got all these animals, and they smell blood. And it's barbecue time during Passover. They just dumb sheep? I don't think so. I think what they were doing was that they were smelling like them brothers and sisters were getting ready to be like, and so when he opened up the opportunity to like boogie, they headed for the hills, Jack. And once they were heading out, you don't think everything in their way got knocked over? Let's be real, how small, if you've been to a bazaar in the Middle East, or you've been to even the streets of old Jerusalem where all the little stalls are, you tell me that even just one goat running crazy for his life would knock over an awful lot of stuff and start a whole bunch of chaos. So the reality of what Jesus was and did isn't some kind of guy that was muscle bound and beating people up. He wasn't a mason so that he was carving stone like some people try to make the carpenter's son not to be a pro worker in wood. Huh, because they look at Israel today and they say, oh, well, he was a carver of wood or a stone. He was a stonemason. No, he was a carpenter's son. You don't think God knows what he's saying and saying what he means? Sheesh. He cut wood. So what? Woodcutter. You carve. You know, you make things out of it. Tables. Bowls. <laughs> but the point is, is that the scripture already describes for us what Jesus was like. But what the virtues of Jesus is like is what he spoke of on the Sermon on the Mount. His reality of not being caught up into political arenas, social games, manipulations by religious leaders, or any other avenue is all summed up in the Sermon on the Mount. If you want to know what Jesus is like in his virtues and in his way of teaching and in what he wanted his disciples to be like as he spoke to them, afterwards and he told them this, I'm going to tell you straight up guys all these teachings I just told you all these sayings of mine if you do them you're like a wise man you know that built his house upon a rock because the storms of life are going to come and they're going to beat upon this house you know and if you want to have a house that stands I suggest you do these sayings of mine but if you don't do them then I'll tell you what's going to happen well, you see, if you don't do what I said, and you don't do what I meant, which is directly what I said, because I said what I mean, and I meant what I said, because I said my yes is yes and my no is no, so this is obviously what I meant, and it's not some kind of parable or story, then let's be real. If you don't do what I said, these sayings of mine, it's like a house built upon sand. Hey, high tide, sand castles, goodbye. So... Your choice, really, as a disciple of Jesus, is to do what he said. It's to allow him to bring out from inside you, as you study, as we are, being a disciple now, not just a follower, as you read his word and you pray and you consistently do those things you're supposed to do, is to bring out from in you all that he said he would do in you. He's going to take the inside bring out and you will love your enemies you might as well start now and practice <laughs> you will turn the other cheek you will be blessed in being poor oh yeah and you will be persecuted for righteousness sake I guess really all you got to do, find out what your life is all about, is just follow through with what he said. Because if you do, I think you're going to get to this place where suddenly, you know, like the skies open up and the disciples go, whoa, Lord, you are revealed. Wow, we thought you were just a man. Look at you, your, your, your glory is revealed here. Let's build a temple right here, right now. Wow, let's just worship. As some of you probably already do, because you get into worship, but you don't get into the Word. <laughs> don't be here. 
But really, God will, if you want to, keep on with this, every day watching the videos and walking with God and talking with Him, you will develop to the place where God will say, Hey, I want to show you something today. And he just goes, and you see just like Stephen, Whoa! I see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the Father. Are you sure? You will hear God speak. I think He did it for me. You will experience all that He promised. And who knows? You might become a pastor. <laughs> Although, no offense. Even though what I said in the beginning, you could probably replay and double check. But somehow, picturing me a pastor in a church somewhere, I doubt it. <laughs> but you never know. <laughs>